Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about COPD exacerbations. Now, patients who have COPD are prone to these exacerbations, and typically this is going to cause them to be in the hospital. Remember that a lot of patients with COPD, they tend to be sick patients uh, overall. Um, they are usually a little bit older, uh, chronic smokers. A lot of them are still smoking. Uh, so a lot of these patients you will see in the hospital if you work internal medicine uh, You'll certainly have a lot of COPD exacerbation patients here now I did talk about COPD in another video uh, I would recommend that you watch that uh, before going on to this one because I'm not going to go too much into the uh, details of COPD so just kind of going over what COPD is really quickly. It's a progressive non-reversible obstructive pulmonary disease, which stands in contrast to asthma, which is reversible with a beta agonist, uh, highly reversible. And pretty much always COPD is secondary to long-term smoking. The number that I got was 80%, but it seems like it's much more than that. It's a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. COPD is really a umbrella term for two different diseases, which are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Most patients have features of both emphysema and chronic bronchitis. However, the difference between emphysema and chronic bronchitis primarily is how they uh, are pathologically. So emphysema is a destruction of the alveoli, which uh, results in decreased saturation because there's less surface area for oxygen exchange, whereas chronic bronchitis is a chronic inflammation of the airways, which re results in excessive secretion of mucus. Uh, this is a clinical diagnosis in which the patient needs to have at least three consecutive months of daily productive cough in at least two consecutive years. Generally, COPD presents in patients who are in their 40s or 50s. They complain of a productive cough, shortness of breath, uh, shortness of breath on exertion, uh, difficulty breathing, breathlessness. You'll hear wheezing a lot on physical exam. Uh, but other than that, your physical exam is not going to tell you a whole lot because when most patients present with COPD, it's relatively early on in their disease. Pretty much uniformly, patients with COPD uh, with these symptoms will have a history of smoking, and that's really going to tip you off towards uh, a COPD diagnosis. What we're going to talk about here is COPD exacerbations, which happens in patients who already have COPD, uh, but for some reason, suddenly their COPD symptoms get worse. So uh, remember that with any obstructive disease, what, uh, why we know it's obstructive is because we have a decrease in the FEV1 to FEC ratio. So as you're uh, inhaling or exhaling, particularly exhaling, it's harder to get the air out. And so it takes longer to fully exhale, it takes longer to get, uh, you, you get less air out in one second, and so that's going to decrease your FEV1 to FEC ratio. When you have an exacerbation, you have an acute worsening, and so the symptoms suddenly get worse, and that can be due to an infection, it can be due to congestive heart disease, which coexists in a lot of COPD patients because of their age, a lot of times because of their lack of healthy habits. Uh, it can also be due to air pollution, uh, it can be due to, uh, it can be due to uh, various, uh, when I say air pollution, you know, that could be like smog, it can be allergens, uh, or one-thirds of the time, it's really, we don't know why. What you need to know is when you have a patient that's in a COPD exacerbation, um, so you can treat them. It's not so much important that you know exactly why, uh, but you need to know that they are in a COPD exacerbation. And the way you know that is that they've already been diagnosed with COPD or they have the symptoms that are consistent with emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and they've got an acute worsening of their symptoms. So as mentioned, a COPD exacerbation is an acute worsening of symptoms brought on by infection, congestive heart failure, air pollution, or an idiopathic factor. Differential diagnosis includes primarily pulmonary embolism and pulmonary edema. So both of these will present in similar ways as far as dyspnea, uh, uh, dyspnea both resting and dyspnea on exertion, shortness of breath, and so forth. Uh, and they can present acutely. 
the difference with pulmonary embolism is that you're going to get a continuous deterioration that's not response not responsive to your supplemental oxygen or to bronchodilators. With pulmonary embolism, because we have a blockage in the pulmonary circulation, you can also get jugular venous distension. And a lot of these patients with pulmonary embolism will also have risk factors. So they are, they just had surgery, they've got factor V Leiden, they've got any kind of uh, prothrombosis uh, condition. Uh, any of those things can put them at risk for pulmonary embolism. So their history is going to be important too. If you suspect pulmonary embolism, uh, you should get a CT. Your chest x-ray is not going to be enough. With pulmonary edema, you're going to note on your chest x-ray that there's generalized lung opacity. With COPD, generally the chest x-ray doesn't look very abnormal. You may, have, you may see some more ribs, some diaphragmatic flattening, but you're not going to see opacity with just a regular COPD exacerbation. Unless the patient has pneumonia, um, in which case you might see, uh, you might see a segment of lung that's, uh, that's opaque, but uh, with pulmonary edema, you have generalized lung opacity. So those two things can appear to be like a COPD exacerbation, um, but uh, they are less common. You should get baseline laboratories in any patient that presents with dyspnea with a history of COPD. So baseline laboratories, I mean CBC, CMP, and an EKG. Why do you want to get those? Because if the patient has pneumonia, which can be a cause of a COPD exacerbation, you're going to note that on your, uh, on your CBC. The patient could also have dyspnea because of a heart condition, and so you're going to want to get an EKG as well. So those are just your baseline laboratories. Going back, and I mentioned this in the COPD episode, when do you admit the patient? It's pretty much any time where you think there's going to be, a, that there's a COPD exacerbation. So number one, when there's worsening saturation that's not responsive to your general outpatient management. And by general outpatient management, I mean nasal cannula or a mask. So if you can't get their saturation above 90 with a, uh, with a nasal cannula, then you should be admitting the patient because they're probably going to need more treatment than they can get at home. 90 is the magic number. Of course, you're also going to get, and I actually didn't include it here, you should also be getting ABGs as part of your baseline laboratories. If on their ABGs they have hypercapnia, that's a definitive uh, admitting factor. So you're going to be admitting them if they have hypercapnia. Definitely, definitely if they have an altered mental status, you're going to be admitting them. Never discharge a patient with altered mental status ever. If they have significant comorbid conditions, uh, severe congestive heart failure, if they've got signs of pneumonia on, uh, on their CBC, elevated white count, you're going to admit them. Or if they have inadequate or unreliable home care. Okay, so you diagnose the patient with a COPD exacerbation. Their symptoms have gotten worse with their COPD acutely. What do you do? First, you're going to be giving them supplemental oxygen. And that makes sense because you'd be doing that for them at home with their COPD anyway. That's part of their treatment for COPD. So what do you give them as far as supplemental oxygen? Uh, well, first, maintain saturation above 90. So that's our goal. How we do it is going to uh, depend on how bad it is. So first you're going to use a nasal cannula or mask. So we start with our least invasive and go from there. If you can't keep it above 90 with a nasal cannula or mask, then you can use non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is really your CPAP or your BiPAP. And that's just a mask, but it's attached to a machine that generates pressure to help uh, get oxygen uh, uh, into their lungs. So that's going to be uh, our, our second step. So we prefer to use a nasal cannula or mask, but if that's not getting them above 90, then we're going to use uh, NIPPV. If that's not doing the trick, then you're going to have to do mechanical ventilation. All right, uh, what else do we do? We give them their inhaled beta agonists. And this is primarily to reduce their symptoms, but it doesn't uh, decrease mortality. 
What you are going to do with their beta agonist is that depending on whatever dose they have, you're going to give them the next higher dose. So you don't give them the same dose as they're taking at home, and that makes sense because they already have been taking that. So uh, you up their dose on their beta agonist. And I will add, you can give them uh, anticholinergics as well if they're taking that at home. So uh, you can use beta agonists and anticholinergics simultaneously, or you can just use the beta agonists. It really doesn't matter as long as you're upping the dose of the beta agonists. You're going to give them oral corticosteroids. Now, this is different than compared to uh, what you're doing on an outpatient basis. On an outpatient basis, you're generally giving the patient uh, inhaled corticosteroids. With a COPD exacerbation, we're concerned about the inflammation, and so we want to give them something a little bit stronger, so we give them uh, a PO corticosteroid. We're giving them broad-spectrum antibiotics as well, and this is, uh, has been shown to increase survival. So uh, you can, uh, and, and you're going to do this regardless of what the chest x-ray comes back as. So broad-spectrum antibiotics, generally what's been recommended is a fluoroquinolone plus or minus a macrolide. So IV ciprofloxacin plus oral azithromycin would be a common uh a common regimen for a COPD exacerbation, but I mean really there's multiple different ways that you can treat them. Uh, you just have to make sure that you've got a broad spectrum. Uh, other things that have been used are second generation macrolides alone, um, some of the uh, uh, augmented drugs like amoxicillin clavulonate, uh, and then uh, some of the exp uh, extended spectrum fluoroquinolones like levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. You also want to have a chest x-ray that's going to help you with your differential. But remember, regardless of what the chest x-ray comes back as, we're going to be giving them broad spectrum antibiotics. If the patient is going to be bedridden, if they're not going to be getting up and moving, then you're going to want to give them subcutaneous uh, enoxaparin. Remember, that's a low molecular weight heparin, uh, also known as Lovenox. So this you want to give them if they're not ambulatory. I would err on the side of just giving it to them rather than not because most patients with COPD exacerbations are going to be in bed most of the time. So uh, this is something that's... Uh, worth erring on the side of doing rather than not doing. ABGs are going to be useful. You're going to want to get ABGs before you admit them, uh, but you also want to get ABGs to assess their progress. Uh, they need to have normal ABGs if you're going to discharge them. And then an aggressive pulmonary toilet is very important with COPD exacerbation. So using the incentive spirometer, making sure they're, they're breathing in and breathing out regularly, uh, that's, that's super important because that's going to uh, reduce the risk of infection. Other things that are going to be important is to avoid opiates and sedatives. Those things may make the patient feel better, but it's going to suppress respiration. So you want to avoid opiates and sedatives in general. They can get up and move around as tolerated. There's uh, certainly no contraindication to, uh, to moving around. As a matter of fact, it's preferred because it's going to, it's going to increase the respirations. Of course, like any COPD, you should be counseling them on smoking cessation. And another thing that's important to do while they're in the hospital is to counsel them on the use of their inhalers. A lot of people don't use their inhalers properly. Now, you're, you don't necessarily have to do this as the physician, but the nursing staff can counsel them on the proper use of inhalers. About 50% of patients that I've seen don't use their inhalers properly. They'll they get all the medicine in their mouth and they don't get it down into their lungs. So teaching proper use of inhalers uh, is, is, uh, is going to be pretty important as well. Overall, patients with COPD exacerbations tend not to fare well. There's a pretty high mortality rate within five years of having their first COPD exacerbation. Uh, however, the uh, mortality rate is uh, is 
linked to their FEV1. So we're not going to be doing spirometry while they're in the hospital most of the time, but mortality tends to be linked with FEV1. So if they've got a lower FEV1, obviously they have more obstruction, that's going to be a lower survival. If, uh, if they've got a better FEV1, then that's going to be better survival. And uh, that's pretty much it.